Hello, my name's Julian Savalescu. I'm the Chen Su Lan Centennial Chair in Medical Ethics at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. I'm also the Director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics. Okay, so should we enhance, uh, or more relevant today's topic, um, select better people? And I'm gonna give you three arguments. The first one is that it would be wrong not to enhance. So um, I, I described this case uh, where we could conceive a child now and the child would be disabled um, with say Zika, but if we wait, the child would be normal. Everyone thinks that would be wrong. Um, if we conceive a child now, the child will have a normal IQ, but if we wait a month and take iodine, the child will have a higher IQ. Um, we have the same reason, the value of intellectual um, capability to wait in the second case as we do in the first. So if we accept the treatment of disease, um, and disease is not the only thing that's relevant, then we should also accept uh, selection for non-disease traits. Uh, consistency, we, we wait to maximize the environment we give to our children, um, and that will mean that different children are born. Are born. Different sperm and an egg will produce a different child 20 years later, um, and we often wait until we have enough money to provide a good education. But that will be good education for a different child. Uh, there's no difference between environmental and biological interventions. Um, environmental interventions can alter our biology. Um, rats, given a stimulating environment, um, uh, develop higher levels, higher cognitive abilities. And if you deprive rats of love, uh, they, they have intellectual uh, disability and, and that's passed on to their offspring. This slide shows. The last argument is there's no difference to the treatment of disease. Um, it's it's, it's um, what the goodness of health with, which drives the moral obligation to treat or prevent disease, but health, as I've argued, is not the only thing that matters. It enables us to live, but what matters is not that we have healthy lives, it's that we have good lives. Um, and how well our lives go depends in part on our biology and selection allows us to alter that biology. Um, many people um, are attracted to a distinction between treatment of disease and enhancement of normal traits. Uh, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, the American uh, philosophers Michael Sandel and, and Leon Kass have all said it's okay to select embryos for again to, to select against major diseases like Huntington's disease, but not to select for uh, higher than normal intelligence. However, uh, abortion, contraception, and other interventions like these uh, enable procreative liberty, but they're not treatments of disease. Pregnancy is not a disease. These are enhancements. And, and aging involves the loss, uh, the normal loss of faculties such as hearing, memory, sexual potency. Uh, and the fact that these are normal uh, and, and a part of normal aging does not make them good or any less bad. And in fact, the definition of disease is just a statistical definition. So um, disabilities, according to the medical definition, are functionings, two standard deviations below the mean for uh, a reference class, male or female of a certain age. So intellectual disability is an IQ, two standard deviations below the mean of 100, which means that 2% of people will have intellectual disability. But the choice of two standard deviations is entirely arbitrary. We could have chosen one standard deviation, in which case 15% of people would have had intellectual disability. Or we could have said that uh, being in the bottom 50% constitutes a disease. Um, where we draw that line depends on how significant that line is for our well-being. And through most of human history, having an IQ between 70 and, and 130, which is described as normal, was enough to function adequately. It's not enough today to, to function and flourish in a technologically advanced society. So having an IQ between 70 and 85 is often described now as low normal. It's normal, but it's a significant disadvantage to life prospect. Uh, people sometimes argue that we need diversity uh, of different people However, 
uh, what diversity is desirable um, depends on, on how good the lives are of those who are diverse. And uh, it's true that low normal IQ is a form of diversity, uh, but if it represents a significant obstacle, it's nonetheless bad and ought to be corrected. Um, diversity is sometimes said to be important to resist uh, infectious you know, insults or infectious threats. For example, um, through most of human history, the HIV um, pandemic um, would have been addressed by the human species by a very small number of genetically privileged or immune individuals surviving and repopulating the species. That's not how we address um, infectious threat, as we've seen from the COVID pandemic. We develop um, treatments and preventions, preventative strategies for disease. And indeed, genetic selection could be used to increase genetic diversity. Um, and uh, we no longer uh, require just using brute evolution as a, as a and, and survival of the fittest through genetic selection to um, deal with the threats that we face. Uh, another uh, objection that people give to genetic selection is that we shouldn't select individuals. We should um, we shouldn't we shouldn't um, change people. We should change society. We should alter social arrangements to promote well-being, and not biologically alter um, on or, or select people. Um, and, and this is related to the social constructivist view of disability. The disability is just a disadvantage imposed by the construction of society. Um, this is related to the idea that disability is just a difference um, and not intrinsically bad. So um, we have good reasons to prefer social rather than biological interventions if they're safer, more likely to be successful, if they promote other goals of justice, if there's there are benefits to others or less harm to others if they preserve identity rather than change identity, but vice versa. Um, if we have, if, if biological interventions are safer, more successful and so on, we have reasons to prefer them. And it's just an open question whether um, genetic selection uh, or environmental or social manipulation is, um, is the best strategy. The, the argument that disability itself is socially constructed um, depends on whether, uh, you know, th that we have, that those with disabilities have a claim of justice, that it's unfair that their lives are not going as well as possible. But justice can't require strict equality that everyone have the same level of well-being. Uh, it, it, um, it is the case that uh, resources are limited that we have to make decisions about the allocation of limited resources and that um, we have to uh, you know, give people a good enough go, but we can't give everyone an equal go. And that biology will remain a determinant uh, of, of differences in, in prospects of, of wellbeing. And um, we need to consider the reasons for and against interventions at all levels, social, psychological and biological. Um, Sometimes people say that uh, having a variety of people, of diversity, of having disabled lives uh, improves society in other ways. This is not obviously true in all cases. Having some psychopaths may have been beneficial uh, under conditions of tribal warfare, but it's not uh, conducive to um, survival of, of the species or societies when psychopaths have access to weapons of mass destruction. And it's not clear what uh, balance of different traits is optimal for society. So again, where it's unclear, we should resort to procreative liberty. One of the strongest objections to um, procreative beneficence and selective um, uh, selection of, of um, more desirable traits is that we'll uh, increase inequality and result in genetic discrimination. And this was popularized in the film Gattaca, uh, which, which um, described a two-tier society of the genetic elites and the, genetic, uh, the genetically underprivileged. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, 
not all cases of, of enhancement result in inequality. They can uh, correct inequality. The, the case of iodizing salt or choline in eggs are uh, very cheap interventions that um, can be made accessible to all. And in part, this objection trades on um, restricted access to genetic selection. Um, but it's important to also recognise that nature generates inequality. Um, nature has no mind to uh, the equal distribution of talents and abilities, disabilities and disease. Um, we're all born unequal and uh, science now gives us the, the opportunity of reducing that natural inequality. Um, and the, those in favour of using biology and genetic selection argue that we should, um, we should correct this natural inequality um, to bring about a more equal starting line. Uh, and indeed, importantly, if genetic selection is important, it should be made freely available to everyone, which would reduce inequality rather than increase it. Uh, another uh, raft of objections that, um, that Michael S Sandel has made uh, famous uh, center around humility, responsibility, and solidarity. It's a picture of Lang Lang, the famous um, pianist. Uh, and uh, Lang Lang was um, famously, uh, you know, uh, uh, told by his father that he should commit suicide when he failed to get into the, the Chinese Ac Academy of, um, uh, of, of Music. And uh, Sandel described this as an example of hyperparenting, a sort of hubris, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a pressure of parents to, um, to force their children into certain kinds of lives, that genetic selection would increase and that would reduce solidarity and uh, our sense of responsibility for others because we would now believe that we're entitled on the basis of our superior genes to our accomplishments. Um, I think this, this whole range of objections is misplaced. How we treat our children, how we treat each other are entirely separate from uh, decisions to, um, to, to select children with a better prospect of a better life. Indeed, Lang Lang was not genetically selected uh, and, and whatever uh, objections there are to, to, the, to the parenting he experienced, um, they apply in the absence of genetic selection. Uh, a related um, objection is that um, children should be um, be allowed uh, a, a, an open future, um, the so-called right to an open future, that um, everyone should uh, start off life with uh, uh, you know, uh, a clean slate and that we shouldn't have to live in the shadow uh, of existing individuals uh, and, and indeed our parent, parents' expectation. Um, however, uh, in, rela in relation to the previous objection, uh, whether we have an open future is determined not by you know, um, genetic selection. Uh, indeed, genetic selection can increase the openness of our future by giving us talents, um, but in particular by how our parents and society treat us and, enables, uh, uh, and how, it, how much it enables us to develop our talents uh, and abilities. And indeed, treating people differently on the basis of their genes is a form of genism, I've described, where just because somebody is born with a certain genetic trait, be it um, genes for higher IQ or um, Down syndrome or, or clone, or as being the result of a clone, is treating them on the basis of their genes and not um, in virtue of their humanity and um, their nature as a human individual. And we, we can be open to the unbidden, even in the presence of genetic selection. Uh, I've mentioned eugenics. Clinical genetics is a form of um, eugenics in, in one sense. It enables selection of individuals with lower chances of disease. Um, but what's important is that, the, that modern genetics is voluntary. It is in the interest of the child and it's not for social Darwinist reasons. 
So provided we give people reproductive freedom, the right to, to say yes or no, um, offering these um, opportunities of selecting children with a better prospect of a better life is not objectionable forms of eugenics. Again, the, dis the argument that it will inevitably result in discrimination as assumes a sort of social determinism that we, we must treat people who are genetically different or genetically selected or not selected differently, um, and that is not true. We can uh, choose to make society a just society uh, even in the presence of genetic selection. So I mentioned the sort of natural inequality that we've been born with and what we require are egalitarian social institutions, whether or not we have genetic selection. Um, how the biologically modified and unmodified are treated is, is a question of our choice. Um, another objection with genetic uh, selection is that, um, you know, when it comes to non-disease traits, it's self-defeating. Um, that if everyone stands on tiptoes, no one sees any better. So if everyone is made um, more intelligent, um, it's not going to have any benefit. Um, now, can, things like height are sometimes described as positional goods. They're only good if other people don't have them. But things like memory, intelligence, impulse control are positional. They, uh, they give a person an advantage if they have more of them in a competition but they're also non-positional. They're also good in themselves. They also make it easier to, to function in the world. So many of these goods are both positional and non-positional. Uh, so other objections have been that, that genetic selection will remove the mystery of life. Uh, there'll be plenty of mystery because we live in a probabilistic world where misfortune uh, no matter how genetically privileged we are, uh, we'll, we'll be just around the corner and death will, will be just around the corner for all of us. And it's still important that we're open to the unbidden. Okay, so I'd like to, to draw to a close now. Um, I think that uh, 21st century medicine offers us the opportunity to develop interventions which not only treat and prevent disease, but make people's lives better. Natural equality, inequality exists and genetic selection is the first of these strategies that can overcome this natural inequality. In the future, there will be genetic engineering, gene editing or artificial chromosomes or internal technologies such as artificial intelligence. And um, George Bernard Shaw famously said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. But Shaw is wrong. Sometimes it's rational to adapt biologically or psychologically to the world. Sometimes we should select the children to have the best lives. But sometimes it's rational to change the world. And which course, um, and sometimes we should accept things as they are. Which course we choose depends on the benefits and risks, the opportunity costs and the context. So we have an obligation to consider all options, changing um, society, changing our environment, changing our psychology and our attitudes to each other, other but also changing our biology. And, and I think we have, um, we have reason to consider uh, selecting children with better chances of better lives. Uh, and at very least, I believe we should have the uh, freedom to make choices about which kind of children we have. Uh, and and uh, and procreative autonomy is the bedrock of reproductive ethics, just as personal autonomy is the bedrock of, um, of medical ethics. Thank you.